Hello, everyone. I'm Justin Moresco, and on behalf of the Applied Technology Council, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on the recently released ATC Design Guide 3, Serviceability Design of Tall Buildings Under Wind Loads. This webinar is made possible with funding from the ATC Endowment Fund. The purpose of the ATC Endowment Fund is to support efforts of critical importance to structural engineering design practice, research, and education. More information about the ATC Endowment Fund can be found on our website. So if you haven't already, you can download the handouts from the handouts pod on the GoToWebinar control panel. We know that many of you are interested in receiving professional development hours for your participation today. Registrants who would like a PDH certificate must attend the full duration of today's webinar and pay $25, and that helps ATC cover some of the costs of hosting the webinar. A link for purchasing a PDH certificate will be sent via email by ATC to all registrants by the end of the week. If at any time during the webinar you have questions, please type them in the questions pod in the GoToWebinar control panel. We're planning to have three live question and answer sessions during the webinar. We'll try to answer all of the submitted questions, and if there are any that we're not able to answer live, we'll provide written responses to them after the webinar. So now that we've gotten through all the housekeeping items, let me tell you about the fabulous team we have assembled here today. Chris Letchford will be leading the presentation. He's head of the Department of Civil and, and Environmental Engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York. Joining Chris during the live Q&A sessions today will be Bill Baker, Larry Griffiths, and Peter Irwin. Bill Baker is a structural engineering consulting partner at SOM, where he has led the structural engineering practice for over 20 years. Larry Griffiths is a professor at Florida International University and senior principal and senior consultant at Walter P. Moore. And Peter Irwin is a founding partner of RWDI and has served at that firm in a variety of key roles, including principal engineer and president and CEO. I'd now like to turn the webinar over to Chris. Chris. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Justin, and I take everybody can hear me. <clears throat> so uh, welcome to this afternoon's seminar. This is a, a much uh, weighted uh, design guide for the serviceability uh, for tall buildings. And we'll see that there's been a, a, a rush of publications in this space in just the last couple of years. But uh, it's a great privilege to present this seminar on behalf of the authors and um, if I uh, just acknowledge those, Peter Irwin, Larry Griffiths and uh, Bill Baker uh, and a very uh, uh, well accomplished uh, review panel from ATC, um, Melissa Burton, Leighton Cochran, Ahmad Haramenian and Don Scott uh, and uh, I and John Heinz were uh, yeah, the editors of the document. So I look forward to presenting to you uh, really uh, today uh, on only two of the three topics that are covered in the design guide. The, the design guide covers the background to wind loading of tall buildings and that could be uh, a separate seminar or webinar all on its own. So I'm not planning to address that but that is covered in the design guide. What I will be covering today and what you'll be learning about are the serviceability issues and in particular uh, the serviceability measures that are proposed in this design guide and they relate to two topics. One is the motion criteria for human occupancy and that deals with a vibration of tall buildings and we'll see some of the research that backs up the motion criteria and the other is the drift or deflection criteria for cracking uh, and we'll also uh, discuss those uh, today. So in terms of serviceability, uh, if we go to an authority text on this, uh, serviceability is a state in which the function of a building, its appearance, maintainability, durability and comfort of its occupants are preserved under normal usage. And so that's really the governing principle of serviceability. And that's taken up by a couple of documents which I'm sure the audience is familiar with. The IBC of 2018 addresses serviceability, but you'll see in its definition, it largely talks about deflection issues rather than vibration issues. And then if we go to uh, ASC 716, it addresses serviceability in two sections. 
uh, one that relates to, again, mostly stiffness or deflection issues. Uh, and then another which talks about serviceability requirements, uh, section 1.32, which talks about not only deflections and drift, but also vibration. And so that's a, a critical issue uh, in uh, tall buildings, the, the motion and, the, uh, and its impact on the occupants. So as I said, we're going to be talking about serviceability and in particular serviceability issues related to motion, vibration and drift. So in terms of uh, tall building uh, considerations for serviceability, we've already indicated drift, uh, the relative deflection, floor on floor, or overall perhaps, uh, and vibration, that is uh, the motion of the building under the uh, fluctuating wind loads, uh, the response of the structure and how that impacts the occupants of the building. So why am I here and uh, how can I help? Well, in the, there are very few uh, limits or advice on serviceability requirements under wind loading uh, and it is often left to the designer uh, in consultation with the client uh, and using uh, engineering judgment to apply appropriate levels of drift and or perception tolerance motion criteria. So the idea here is to address that engineering judgment uh, collectively from the expertise of uh, the three authors. And uh, in terms of uh, building codes, uh, in particularly in the United States, AISC and ACI also leave serviceability design checks to engineering judgment of the designer. So this document is really to help in that process. And we uh, also have uh, very recently though, two other publications, ASC 143, and uh, the new ASC performance-based wind engineering pre-standard. So I'm just going to bring those uh, to the fore before we dive into ATC Design Guide 3. So in terms of these two other documents that relate to serviceability issues, the new performance-based uh, wind engineering pre-standard was issued by ASC in 2019. We'll have a brief look at that. And uh, again, just last year, uh, ASC Manual of Practice 143 uh, talks about design and performance of tall buildings for wind. So we have other documents now accumulating in this space, but we believe ATC Design Guide 3 is a, a beautiful summary of that information. So in terms of the pre-standard, it talks about performance objectives in chapter four, and then does look at various acceptance criteria uh, to what makes uh, the performance being met in the two main areas uh, that engineers are interested in, the main wind force resisting system, uh, and that deals with occupant comfort by and large, and then the uh, acceptance criteria for building envelope systems, and that clearly is dealing more with uh, deformation uh, issues. So uh, that's uh, interesting and we see that uh, in terms of here uh, the um, different uh, systems, the main wind force resisting and the bin building envelope and then non-structural components division and across the different performance measures in terms of comfort uh, and then operational or continuous occupancy under a limited interruption, we see a range of performance objectives and a range of acceptance criteria for each of these systems and for each of these performance levels. What's uh, interesting is that these are typically, uh, the acceptance criteria are called up or this document calls up ATC Design Guide 3. So you can see that we're an integral part of the new performance-based approach to wind engineering. In terms of the Manual of Practice uh, 143 that came out last year, they also talk about uh, serviceability, serviceability issues, particularly uh, the two that I've already mentioned, drift and then motion, and they recommend uh, uh, mean recurrence intervals for those two types of, of uh, considerations for serviceability, a 10 year and one year, we'll see, we'll come back to those return periods a little later on. And then it talks about uh, various criteria in terms of uh, deformation, and these are related to uh, uh, drift deformation typically, uh, or in fact, uh, the damage measurement index, and I will explore that uh, measure of uh, drift or de deformation uh, later on in this presentation. But I just wanted to bring that to your attention that there are a couple of other documents in this space, and, and some of them call up 
uh, Design Guide 3. So in terms of uh, that manual of practice, when it comes to talk about motion of buildings and occupant comfort, we are talking about the acceleration that the building experiences and that's imparted into the occupants of the building. And there are various levels that are important in considering that acceleration. So first of all, there's the perception of the motion. And uh, that of course uh, ranges over perhaps an order of magnitude of acceleration. And we'll see some of that later in this presentation and then there's uh, and that's typically at something like a monthly return period uh, and then it talks about keeping occupants comfortable under more frequent events and that's typically about one year and then when we're looking at greater return periods and hence larger magnitude accelerations uh, we're talking about uh, managing the discomfort and that's typically at about a 10 year return period. So again, we will see these return periods uh, recur in uh, the design guide three. So in terms of uh, where the background for this uh, work has come from, there's two very good documents clearly, uh, uh, one produced by my good colleague, Kenny Cock uh, and Melissa Burton, uh, an ASC monograph that came out uh, a couple of years ago. And that's really a accumulation of all the research that went into motion induced or wind induced motion and its impact on occupants. And what we hope is now Design Guide 3, which distills all of this research into some fairly succinct recommendations, which I will then cover uh, today. So in terms of um, the problems that engineers face, more often than not, they're typically uh, most interested in structural failure or indeed avoiding structural failure. And it may have seen that uh, it was the architect's problem to look at environmental failures and they might be considered in, in a sense, three areas, uh, safety, uh, and we'll see that that's typically around wind climate, wind flow around buildings, uh, comfort, and uh, that's an issue that we will be specifically addressing today and then uh, the economics uh, that are impacted through unsafe or uncomfortable environments. And uh, there's a couple of publications in that space about managing wind climate. I am not going to address those today. In terms of issues of comfort, there's clearly those relate to wind environment. And that again is a, the subject of a, another talk, but that's dealing with uh, ensuring that outdoor spaces are pleasant to occupy uh, under various wind conditions. What we are specifically talking about today, uh, wind induced motion of tall buildings in particular, and they relate to occupant comfort, and that can be the motion of the building, uh, potentially leading to motion sickness if it's severe enough, or indeed the noise that that motion uh, generates in a structure, uh, damage to structure due to the motion, uh, particularly for tall buildings, elevated disruption. And uh, if uh, the deformation is large enough during uh, storms to allow water penetration, that's also a problem. And uh, if you don't believe that these are important issues, this is a photograph uh, from Central Park in New York with some of the new skinny skyscrapers. And uh, there are some downsides to living in these in terms of leaks, creeks, and if I was Canadian, bricks. So what serviceability criteria are we interested in? Uh, as this cartoon sort of indicates, uh, people typically think mostly about the motion, but it is also the noise that is generated that's a problem. Uh, and what we hope is the recommendations of this design guide will help to uh, limit those problems. And if you don't believe that noise is a problem, maybe you've stayed in this hotel in San Francisco, and potentially received this uh, little note under the door, or perhaps nowadays it would be sent to your phone um, for your uh, benefit. So at this stage, I'm going to pause uh, and see if there are any questions uh, about uh, the background to Design Guide 3, the material that we've uh, assembled uh, or gone through to assemble Design Guide 3. So Justin, I will pause there for any questions. All right, Chris, yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so we, we do have two. Uh, the, the first is 
why historically have building codes left serviceability design checks to engineering judgment when, as was described, the issues from wind-induced motion can be significant? So I think Bill Baker is going to be the best to, to, to address that question. Well, uh, there's been a, a great deal of uncertainty in this. You know, this is a developing um, science. You know, and what we have now is, I call it a, a snapshot of where we are in time. And, I, I, and I'd be very surprised if it doesn't change over time as we as we learn learn more. And uh, and a lot of times it was, it was viewed as an issue of quality. Okay, that that was a, that was a discussion between the owner and the design team. You know, uh, it, it was it was because it's not a life safety issue, which is very important to understand. And so, uh, if you have a very high quality project, maybe you want it to move less. And and so, you know, that that's a lot of uh, of kind of the, the background. But but as we've learned more and more, now we're able to like you know, give us better guidance. But once again, this is a, th th these are uh, guidelines we're giving. This is not like black and white where something breaks. Uh, you know, perception, as as um, Chris is going to talk about later, is you know a very difficult thing to put much precision on. Certainly, um, Larry or Peter, would you like to uh, add to that? <clears throat> yeah, just real quick. This is Larry Griffiths. Uh, you know, the, the issue of codification of serviceability criteria has been a debate that's gone on in the in the profession through a lot of committees for for some time. And I would I would suggest that a decision has been made generally not to codify it because of the lack of precision and the different uh, procedures that different people use. But I have to tell you, and there, there was also a legal issue. There was some concern about, well, if we codify this stuff and it's not terribly precise, what kind of legal challenges could we get into as designers? But I think the landscape has changed, as Bill mentioned. I, I think this younger generation is very interested in thinking about, at least, the debate is coming about codification of some of these guidelines. It'll be coming up in the next cycle, uh, the next so code cycle. Thank you, Larry. Uh, and very quickly, Peter, any comments from you? No, I think uh, Bill and Larry have summarized it fairly well. The origin, the origin of codes was really focused on life safety. And the, you know, there were laws back in the Greek and Roman times if a building collapsed and somebody died, then the architect uh, I guess had his head chopped off <laughs> or was duly punished. So uh, it's a very different thing from serviceability, but that's the origin of codes. Very good. Justin, do you want to go to another question or should okay. we Okay. We, let, let's do one more. Um, I, so the, the, the question is, how do you think building officials are going to react to these guidelines? Often we see these guidelines are taken too strictly by building officials. Um, I do think that's a, a genuine problem given as Bill alluded to the almost order of magnitude of perception of motion across the human population. So uh, I, I think, um, Lines in the sand may be very difficult, but I'll, uh, I'll uh, seek my colleagues, perhaps uh, again, Bill. Well, well yeah, it, it is a real issue. I mean, sometimes uh, uh, code officials or building officials will will take guidelines uh, as gospel. And and, uh, and you have to, um, you know, and, uh, but I, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have the guidelines. Uh, it, it's up to the design professionals to try to perhaps educate the uh, the code officials about you know that you know that these are guidelines and not and not a life safety uh, you know a beam collapsing type issue this this is this is stuff that that is uh, and it's an evolving technology and and so hopefully uh, but but I, I know uh, uh, I'm sure Larry we all, everyone on the design side has had that issue where you're going <laughs> to get a uh, trying to get a building permit and and somebody uh, takes uh, takes something that's not precise and tries to tries to enforce it as if it were a gospel. Uh, Larry, did you need to add to that? No, I think that's, that pretty well covers it. I, I'll have to say that some people think that when you put these design guides and criteria uh, in commentaries, it becomes a, a de facto standard, which I think is sometimes true. And it depends a lot on the, on the sophistication of the building official and 
whether they hire a consultant to review the plans. And there's a lot of ways that's handled around the country. But uh, certainly when we develop design guides and put some of this stuff in there, they, they can become de facto standards. Great. Well, thank you for that. And uh, I think at this stage we will move on. Justin? Yeah, agreed. So uh, now I'll move to the second part of the presentation where I'm really talking about, uh, first of all, vibration uh, of buildings and the criteria as, uh, associated with vibration. Uh, and then the third part will be related to uh, deformation. So in terms of vibration, a lot of research was done um, in motion simulators. Uh, and here you see a picture of one, uh, I believe in Canada, and it's uh, typically a ship motion simulator. Uh, and you can see uh, Peter Irwin in the picture here. And this was used really to educate um, clients, as I understand it, and get a sense of what was acceptable and what was not, because it is very much a, a, a human perception issue. And then subsequent research has really explored the complexity of this problem of a human being, which is both uh, physiological, psychological and physical in nature, coming to this vibration uh, of a tall building. So in terms of the human cognition system and the environmental impacts that are important, we have uh, the mental state, the psychological influences that are an issue. We have the physical influences that are issue and what we'll be typically dealing with is the vibration here, uh, given that these other issues are controlled. And then of course there are uh, physiological influences on the, the, the variety of human beings that are occupying a building. And again, all of this applies to a fairly complex structure, the human system, which is uh, structural, hydraulic, electrical, and chemical thermal in nature. But as I say, the only thing that we are really uh, looking at here is the frequency of oscillation and how that impacts this very complex system. And so I think that clearly sets the stage for these being guidelines and not hard and fast rules. And, and what's of interest is really to explore some common human accelerations. And what we're talking about here is going from perception down around to 10, uh, 0.01 to 0.1 um, meters per second squared. And because these are typically fairly small numbers, we often deal now in a term called a milli G, which is one thousandth of G. So perceptions in that range, one to 10 milli G. Uh, across the human population. If we look at some other common accelerations, train, car, uh, a roller coaster, some of these are clearly uh, cho uh, acceptable to humans because they choose to do these things. These are orders of magnitude larger accelerations. Okay, So we're talking about one to 10 for perception and we'll see that that's typically a sort of limit in tall building accelerations. Uh, these are um, fractions of much larger accelerations that humans expose themselves to on a regular basis. Okay, so very small uh, accelerations. When we think about uh, accelerations of, of a building, and here are some measurements, I believe, from John uh, Fitzpatrick uh, of RWD on a tall building, perhaps in Chicago. Uh, here we have acceleration records. Uh, over time uh, in two sway modes, an east-west and a north-south mode, and then uh, a torsional acceleration, as I say, near the top of a building. And the things to note about this are that they are zero mean processes. If the building had a mean acceleration, it wouldn't be staying around. So clearly they are zero mean processes. They can be described by peak accelerations, the largest value, uh, and clearly that varies over time and uh, wind event and uh, also described by the standard deviation. And because these are zero mean processes, we can uh, interchangeably use standard deviation or root mean square. And it's uh, of interest to relate the peak and the RMS accelerations. If it was a purely sinusoidal relationship, the peak would be uh, the square root of two times the standard deviation, so 1.4. These, as you saw, are typically random processes. And so this factor G, the peak factor, is much larger than a sinusoidal 1.4. And 
typically for tall buildings, this is in the range three to 3.7. And it's arrived at through a, a random processes, um, narrow band uh, analysis, where we look at the number of uh, particularly crossings of a, a value, uh, and that's determined by the natural frequency of the structure, the N1 in this equation. And typically it's over a 10 minute period for um, perception of motion issues. So this peak factor is related to the peak acceleration and the standard deviation typically in a 10 minute period, not maybe classically an hour and not three seconds. This is about a lengthy period that will influence uh, a person's perception and response. And then in terms of uh, those three modes, uh, the two sway typically and, and one torsional mode, uh, there's a range of different ways that they can combine uh, in terms of being coupled or uncoupled. Uh, and what's of interest typically when we're starting to think about criteria for maybe a peak acceleration or indeed an RMS acceleration, is clearly the resultant acceleration across those three modes. And, and more often than not, it's only the three lowest modes that are of concern here. So as I say, we're interested in the resultant acceleration. Uh, how does that come about? Well, if uh, the two or three modes, two sway, one torsion are regarded as uncoupled or uncorrelated, then uh, an overall RMS can be determined by uh, some of the squares. Or, and uh, the peak acceleration can also be estimated. And so we have an estimate of peak accelerations for three uh, independent modes. And there are various ways of combining those in uh, Design Guide 3. This is one recommendation uh, that's used in terms of the maximum, uh, weighted maximum, um, in terms of uh, the two uh, sway accelerations and the one torsional acceleration are being a radius uh, for where this uh, acceleration is uh, being measured. And wind, many wind tunnel tests have typically come up with a, a combination factor here of about 0.25 for this uh, relationship. Now, what's, what's of interest is there are other ways of doing this and there are more sophisticated ways of doing this, but this seems to be a, a relatively quick and easy way of estimating the peak acceleration. Uh, from uh, typically the wind tunnel test, and then that can be used in uh, assessing whether the building meets any acceptance criteria or not. So in terms of uh, building motion and occupant responses, let's see what the data suggests. So here we have uh, peak acceleration, and you'll see that I'm no longer going to talk about RMS or standard deviation. Everything's going to be effectively in terms of a peak acceleration. and Clearly different buildings with different natural frequencies end up with typically different peak accelerations. So here is uh, some full scale data uh, of uh, acceptable motion, unacceptable motion, perceived motion, and indeed unoccupied buildings. So in my sense, the unoccupied buildings are of no value in assessing uh, what people uh, object to or what people accept. And so if we think about uh, what is, um, unacceptable motion, then we end up with uh, some sort of a, a band, uh, which is again, frequency dependent, and in the range 10 to maybe 50 millig, something like that, as regarded as definitely motion that was unacceptable by this population. And if we sort of try and estimate what's happening for motion that was not perceived, again, you see clearly a, a frequency dependency and, for most tall buildings, it's in the range less than 10 millig. And clearly where the motion was perceived sits between by and large unacceptable and not perceived. So this is some full scale data to try and get a handle on um, this range uh, of motions and what's acceptable and what's not. If we move to um, thresholds of perception, uh, again, based on some Full-scale data here is uh, some work by Yukio Tamura in Japan. Uh, and what we have here again is peak acceleration versus the building frequency. And every graph I'll try and show you with a 10 millig locator. So you can see that all of these values of perception 
of horizontal motion are below 10 millig by and large, except if you get a really low natural frequency of a building. And uh, these are for percentages of the population. So you can see 1% are very sensitive and can uh, perceive motion down at uh, 1 millig. By and large, everybody, 99% of the population will perceive motion at 10 millig. So again, you see that across the human population, there's a range of perception of an order of magnitude in terms of peak acceleration. And just to contrast this with actual measurements, and I imagine that uh, Yukio uh, did this in a shake table in uh, Tokyo, so they had some ability to uh, measure the, the number of people and the actual uh, frequency. Uh, here are some full-scale measurements by Alan Jiri and uh, some additional full-scale measurements by Roy de Noon. Uh, these were Roy's PhD three control towers in Australia and you can see that uh, over a range uh, of frequencies, typically about 50% of the people would have experienced these and that's indeed what Roy found. So in terms of uh, perception, let's move to uh, toleration and habitability. So again, here's the 10 millig, again, peak acceleration and frequency. Uh, we saw that between one and 10 was no perception, between uh, one and 10 was, or, sorry, below one was no perception, between one and 10 was perception thresholds for most of the population. If we move beyond 10 millig, to region C, then we see this comfort beginning, 10 to 20 millig's. Again, not so frequency dependent, it would seem, except for very low natural frequencies. And then when it starts to beget uh, difficulty in walking, then we're certainly in the range 30 to 40 millig, and beyond that, it's getting uh, uncomfortable. So here is now extending from perception down here at one millig up to say 10 millig's into uh, uh, discomfort or um, uh, intolerable emotion. So this is the background to forming the criteria. Uh, in terms of the motion that we've talked about, typically they've been accelerations of the building because that's what most human beings uh, perceive uh, through their vestibular system but there are also cues from torsional velocity, so the sweeping of a building across the horizon. And so at some stage, there were also uh, torsional velocity criteria. And again, these uh, came about from work, I think from Nick Ishimov. But again, return periods. Um, now we start to see a difference between the type of building or the type of occupancy. So residential and office typically has, uh, residential has a higher or a, a lower threshold, so a higher a criteria to achieve um, than an office building. And that's typically based purely on the time that people would spend in these two uh, facilities. Typically about two thirds of their time is in residence and one third is in office. This was clearly before COVID times where now it's probably uh, substantially more in the residential. But these are criteria for torsional velocity if one wanted to uh, imply, apply those. Of course, any building with large torsional response should be avoided and, and you should talk to your wind engineer about that. So the last question to really talk about here is uh, what return period? And we've started to see something in the range uh, monthly, 0.1 to one year to 10 years. and. Uh, it came about through really the work uh, done um, in Japan and in the United States looking at 10-year uh, return periods and the limits suggested there were of the order of 10 to 30 millig and we've certainly seen that's in the starting to be discomfort region. 10 years though was a rather long time and you typically might have experienced a hurricane in a 10-year period. Uh, and so that could uh, distort the results, uh, partly because people get a lot of warning of a hurricane, so can anticipate or may have even evacuated. Um, more recent research looked at shorter return periods and started to look at uh, the frequency, the natural frequency of the building as an issue uh, and the storm type, whether you had a lot of warning, for instance, a hurricane or much less warning, say uh, a thunderstorm. And finally, uh, the latest uh, research is really focused on uh, 
a fairly short return period, um, partly because that's uh, almost uh, the limit of human uh, recollection of experiences in, in this sense. And so a one year return period is typically uh, used now. If we go to some other recommenders of advice, uh, the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat have typically had uh, advice on a 10 year return period. Again, splitting between residential buildings and office buildings and uh, roughly uh, two thirds um, for residential buildings uh, uh, peak accelerations compared to uh, office buildings. And this again was related to the length of time people spent in these uh, two uh, buildings. This information was independent of the natural frequency of the structure, which we've already seen is probably not safe. Then if we go to uh, the ISO standard from 2007 for a one year return period peak acceleration, again, peak acceleration, versus building natural frequency. Here we see the clear frequency dependency that's coming from the work uh, out of Japan, um, but also Andy Irwin in the UK. And again, we have uh, uh, two types of buildings, offices and residences. Residents have a more severe limit, as I say, typically about two thirds of the office. And that's based purely on waiting from the length of time people spend in the two buildings. And again, we see uh, in the range, um, say four um, up to uh, 10 milliG is the range over most uh, buildings. And again, one other piece of confirmational advice, this is the work uh, codified in a sense with uh, Yukio Tamura's work with the AIJ. Here we have again, uh, annual, so the one year return period peak acceleration. And again, in that range, one to 10 milliG. And uh, if you're trying to anticipate what percentage of the population would be involved, then again, this advice gives you from one to 90, 10 to 90% of the population would uh, experience or perceive this motion. So finally, here are the recommendations of Design Guide 3. Again, peak acceleration in milligi versus natural frequency of the building. Uh, we see three return periods presented, uh, almost monthly, annual or 10 year. And again, for two types of structures or two types of occupancy, office and residential. And again, the residential is slightly more severe, uh, roughly two thirds of the office although the um, monthly or the 0.1 year return period is effectively identical down at that level because the chances are of experiencing something that regularly would be almost the same in either an office or, or a residence. So I think that's uh, the end of this section on motion. So I would like to pause at this stage and seek any questions about the motion criteria that ATC have used none so far on that particular point chris well let's see if we get any that come in but we did have some other questions in the meantime um, so one was about uh, the the rms resultant accelerations do the amplitudes used for the three components need to be taken at the same time value or is it acceptable to use the maximum amplitude of the three components not correlated with time so I think I'll, I'll refer that to Peter Irwin. I think what is of interest are, are how do they combine um, together? So, so you do want to know how they are correlated. Um, <clears throat> if you notice each mode of vibration has a component in say both the X and Y directions, they will be correlated if they're in the same mode. So that has to be taken into account. Thank you, Peter. Okay, another question. This was on the slide relating peak and RMS accelerations. Is peak acceleration determined over a period of 10 minutes? Um, is, is it an average or a maximum spike number? <clears throat> 
So I'll, I'll start by typically these results would um, be repeated in an extreme value distribution fitted to the peaks so that you would have a mean extreme or some, some probability of exceedance of that peak acceleration. Um, so that's what I would suggest uh, happens in wind tunnel tests, but I'll again refer to Peter Irwin. Yeah, I think you're correct, Chris. The, uh, the typical procedure is to work out the expected peak. So if you had a number of 10 minute segments, on average, that would be what you would find as the maximum in each 10 minute segment. Okay, here's here's one on um, on that last slide there, Chris. So why does Design Guide 3 recommend different MRIs for hurricanes and non-hurricane areas? Well, my understanding is that, uh, you know, one year you may not experience a hurricane in a one year return period, uh, you know, so um, it's probably uh, conservative to take a 10 year return period. And so for, Typically, um, non-hurricane regions, the wind field is is not, um, shall I say, random in a sense. In that, you know, whether you get a hurricane or not. Whereas in hurricane areas, um, it's a problem. So I think that's the reason. But I will also refer to Peter Irwin on that. I think. Yeah, the the main reason is that in hurricane areas, uh, there is um, usually a lot of warning of the approach of the hurricane. And Chris had mentioned that psychological factors come into these motion criteria as well. And if they've been watching the weather forecast with an approaching hurricane, they're kind of expecting things not to be normal. So um, that's one reason. Another is it may be quite expensive to make a building um, meet the 10 year criterion in a hurricane area. And then the developer really starts asking questions. Well, you know, are people going to be that about this um, if they've had plenty of warning? So I think those are some of the factors that come into why the design guide doesn't make the 10 year a rigid criterion in hurricane areas. Chris, what do you think? Time for one more? Sure. Okay. So this is related to the slide that where you're showing peak acceleration versus frequency. It was one of the um, earlier ones in this section. Uh, do building movement or does building movement under wind load occur under the classic first mode or can it trigger higher modes? And then there was also a question about where are those accelerations that are plotted taken, if they're taken at the top floor or somewhere else? Uh, well, typically you would be trying to uh, look at the worst acceleration in the building, which clearly is in first mode at the top of the building. But uh, again, I'll probably refer to, um, to to maybe Bill on this. Yeah, and, and, and certainly Peter can comment on this. Uh, for most buildings, it is the first mode shapes, the fundamental mode shapes that, that, that matter. But when you get into a very, very slender building, the higher modes will start to come in. Particularly if, you, if your first mode is quite long, then you, um, your higher modes may actually be within a, a, a frequency of, of interest. Uh, whereas if you have a, a, a building that has a short period, the higher modes will be very short. Okay. And, and so that, that's a part. The other thing is um, when, when you think about these motions, we're talking about at the very top floor, the very top occupied floor in the corner, okay? Uh, because, uh, you know, you, know, uh, uh, you can imagine uh, as the building vibrates, it's, it has a mode shape that, that we've all had in our dynamics class. And, and the top ha is, is the higher you are up the, the mode shape, the more the motion you, 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 you're going to uh, be subject to, and so, uh, so uh, yes, uh, th this criteria is for, and, and and in some of the buildings I'm familiar with, uh, that uh, there'll be people on the lower floors that never feel the building move, but they just they hear the they hear the noise, but they never feel the mood because they're so far down the mode shape that, that they never they never perceive the motion. Uh, uh, Peter, I'm sure you have better better answers than, than mine. <laughs> well, I think I think it's a good question, which becomes more relevant with the extremely slender buildings we're now seeing. 
you know, with height to width ratios of 20 to one and so on. Um, so the higher modes start to become important. I remember working on a, a building in Chicago, Chicago Spire, which didn't get built, but it had a first mode fundamental period of 17 seconds. So the second mode was about five seconds, which is what you typically get with say a 50 story building. So we did consider both modes in that case, but it's a bit difficult to know exactly how to apply the criteria. In situations like that, there's a good uh, motivation to go into a test chamber. And that's what we did in that case. Uh, in fact, the picture that Chris showed in the earlier slide was of the uh, representatives from the developer um, sitting in the chamber and actually experience uh, what, the, what the building would uh, have. And we tried it uh, without a damper, with a damper, and they liked it much better with the damper. So that, the developer makes some decisions. Uh, if I may, uh, you know, uh, Peter and I worked together on the Burj Khalifa, uh, which had, of course, a very slender tower also. And, and in there, the higher modes were important from a strength point of view, actually. Uh, we, we would we would get some um, uh, if you just consider the the fundamental mode uh, uh, there were some um, some some forces up up around 40 or 50 stories that uh, uh, were activated by the higher modes uh, so it, it did act, did actually and so for that we did a, what was called an aero elastic wind tunnel model uh, which was uh, our the idea which could pick up many of the higher modes uh, during the testing Okay, I think uh, we better keep moving. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. So uh, now I'd like to switch to uh, the drift issues in uh, tall buildings. We talked about the vibration for human occupancy. Now we're talking about uh, drift. And in a sense, I've uh, reordered these back to front vibration because I think people are more important than things. But now we're talking about things. So we're talking about cracking and uh, the like of tall buildings. So the, the potential damage uh, clearly has to be considered and uh, how to do that. Well, clearly a, a, a fairly sophisticated analysis model needs to be developed so that all the significant deformations uh, that will ultimately lead to damage can be captured. Uh, and so that's important to develop an, an uh, analysis model that can do that. Uh, then there's the important way of combining the loads. We're talking about wind, but also uh, live, dead, and uh, potentially other uh, environmental loads. So uh, an appropriate load combination to do this uh, analysis under. And finally then uh, defining the damage uh, that's occurred and then the criteria that will apply to that damage. And uh, there have been uh, really two ways of considering that last point. And the first is this idea of a, um, a uh, interstory drift, a deflection over a, of a story height. And that's uh, illustrated in this um, first uh, deformation here under typically flexural load. So we get uh, axial shortening by and large causing uh, an overall a bending deformation. And uh, that's led to typically this drift, interstory drift sort of ratio. But for other types of deformations, particularly shear and racking, uh, in, in particularly in moment frames, uh, it's more important to consider the shear deformation. And so now the topic of a deformation damageable zone is introduced. And that's, if you like, instead of a just a, a drift ratio, now we're talking about a zone where we need to think about what shear strains are causing what damage. And so this damage, uh, deformation zone is what we'll be evaluating rather than straight uh, drift ratios. So in terms of uh, uh, say a moment frame building, a deformation damageable zone would be a panel in that moment frame. And we have four corners typically, and we can start to think about now a deformation damage index, uh, which we saw called earlier as a damage measurement index. So DDI or DMI, same thing. 
uh, and that's defined as the relative displacement, not only in the X or horizontal direction, but also in the Y of each of the sides. So we see an XA and an XC, so the displacement uh, laterally uh, over the height and a displacement uh, longitudinally over the length sort of thing. So this is now a measure of the deformation that's uh, possible in this region. And uh, we'll see that that is perhaps a better way of thinking about damage accumulation rather than straight drift. So there are uh, three ways, uh, three uh, reasons why this um, indicator is better than uh, traditional story drift. The first is that the strain is defined by the DDI and not story drift is typically a true measure of the damage potential, particularly in external cladding uh, and internal partition systems. Um, the DDI accounts for strain caused by the vertical racking, uh, and so that's important in, in flexural systems, uh, such as uh, these uh, mentioned here, brace frames and shear walls or tubes. And this effect is not typically accounted for in the story drift measure. So uh, there are problems uh, of underestimating the damage potential then with that story drift process. And of course, uh, what happens with this DDI is it filters out rigid body rotation of the panel, which by itself does not cause uh, damaging strain. And so the story drift includes clearly the effect of rigid, rigid body rotation, the flexure of the whole structure, and that can lead to uh, an overestimation of the damage potential. So this uh, approach is preferred in uh, estimating damage uh, and drift in uh, tall buildings under wind loading. So we talked about developing a structural model. Well, clearly there are important structural parameters that go into that, uh, both in concrete and steel. And so the guide recommends uh, various stiffnesses to include uh, in your analysis uh, for um, estimating the damage, or that clearly the deformation will require the stiffnesses. And so these are the recommendations for the stiffnesses. And then, uh, of course, the damage is, uh, the model has also got to include some other components that make life more difficult for the structural engineer. And that's typically the soil structure interaction, and so foundation type and stiffness and rotational, vertical and rotational stiffness of the soil will be important, and the modeling of that. So that's clearly important in uh, assessing the overall damage potential. Uh, indeed, it's important to capture the, all the relevant gravity load systems uh, because these uh, deformations are going to be important as well uh, and clearly not to indeed overestimate uh, the stiffnesses of that structure, but also to isolate elements that you do not want to uh, contribute to the stiffness. And in a sense, uh, Bill has a nice story about that with the Sears Tower that we may get to in the last um, question and answer period. And then finally, the load combination, and this is the one that's typically recommended by ASC 7, dead, half, live, and uh, the wind uh, of a particular mean recurrence interval that you're going to check your deformation against. So that's the process for uh, the modeling and uh, uh, load combinations. And then in terms of what's recommended in ASC 7, uh, return period for these sort of uh, deflections and clearly that's uh, as Bill indicated before a discussion between the client or the, uh, the building owner uh, and uh, the engineer as to what level of quality is required but by and large normal is regarded as 25 year return period in this sense and you can see that in a typical design life of a building say 50 years that's got roughly an 87 per chance of being exceeded. So, you know, you do have the opportunity to say that it's more than likely that things will crack uh, in a 50 year design life if I choose a normal 25 year return period. Now, of course, all of these buildings are subjected to fluctuating wind loads. Um, dead and live are, are fairly well understood, but fluctuating wind loads are not. And so you do have to go to wind tunnel tests. And again, that is considered in the design guide, but I am not addressing that in this discussion, other than to point out that you know, ASC 7 is for typically low 
buildings, less than 150 metres, uh, um, and for no significant dynamic response. So not, not significantly low natural frequency or, or low damping, and not having significant crosswind response. And uh, just to do a little bit of wind engineering, here is the base moment of, of this shape building about the XX axis. And here is the wind direction and we start at zero, which is normal to the short wall. And we're looking at now a moment about the X axis. That's the uh, long wind moment. So at zero degrees, we get a range of parameters here. This is the mean value, the solid line, and we see some background response in between. And then we see the peak response, if you like, uh, for different natural frequencies. So again, uh, the lower the natural frequency, the bigger the response. But what I really wanted you to see here is that the crosswind response, if the wind now swings around to normal to the long wall, then we'll get a significantly larger crosswind response. So still moment about the x-axis, but now a much bigger crosswind moment uh, due to wind normal to the, the long wall. And again, the, the lower the natural frequency, the bigger the response. Okay, so uh, you would anticipate having to do wind tunnel studies for any of the buildings that we've been typically talking about here today. And in terms of the limits of this DDI, this calculation of the effective shear strain, here is uh, uh, for the type of exterior cladding or interior position or elevators now, the three areas where damage is likely to be uh, significantly noticeable. Then here is the limits of the DDI. Uh, and you'll see that it's a fairly small number. In fact, it's one over 400. And we'll see a little later on how that relates to some of the other recommendations. But here are, by and large, typically all about one in 400 masonry and um, some metal panels may be a little bit more severe. And then uh, the possible design objectives. Again, this relates to what Bill was saying about the discussion between the building owner and the engineer about the quality and the durability. So here is defined uh, in uh, the design guide, minimum, moderate, high and very high. So uh, this is uh, low dollar and high dollar in a sense. And you might be considering now different return periods. Uh, and you'll see by and large the DDI, the non-dimensional strain is much the same, one over 400 for the lower return periods. Uh, and for the, um, uh, and again, the comment here is related to the standard and quality that's required by the building owner. And I've just put in here the comparison with ASCE one, uh, Manual of Practice 143, which you may remember uh, indicated a one in 400 for the 10 year and a one in 300 for the 50 year. Of course, these are all guidelines and they are based on quality and who's assessing quality, but we are talking about uh, one over 400 as the sort of DDI measure uh, here. So at this stage, uh, I'm going to summarize what we've covered. Uh, the design guide, talks about the background to wind loading, and I have not talked about that. I could easily do a whole webinar on that it's alone. We've talked about uh, serviceability issues, and in particular those that relate to people, motion acceptance criteria, based on um, types of buildings, natural frequency of buildings, perception and tolerability or habitability issues. And we've talked about guidelines for that in terms of millage, uh, and return period. And we've talked about uh, the cracking uh, issues and the deflection criteria used for that. And I, again, I've issued, uh, I've shown you the uh, DDI measures that are published in Design Guide 3 on that issue. So hopefully you should be able to address these uh, issues uh, now and it's time for the final question roundup. So Justin, I will hand it back to you. Great, all right. We do have a bunch of questions. Good. That have come in. All right, so first question, how do you implement the criterion design? Do you use dynamic analysis of wind time history or some other means? So uh, I, again, I will probably refer to Bill and Larry on this issue as practicing structural engineers of renown. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. I'll start, Bill, and then you can chime in. Uh, normally, uh, in past years, uh, it's been customary to use static equivalent loads that come out of the wind tunnel study. Uh, but very interesting, some of the new things that are coming along now with our more horsepower with computers and uh, we're actually looking at time history uh, analyses uh, under wind load, which is getting into the what's been done in seismic now for, for some years. So uh, it's getting more sophisticated, but typically these criteria in past history have been based on static equivalent loads generated from a wind tunnel study. Yeah, and if I could add on there, uh, you, know, the, you know, these are very, very complex and large structures. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, the engineer needs to use judgment as to how precise are their calculations. I've generally found that if you do, a, if you, um, from the buildings we've measured, a steel building where you accurately um, uh, model the, like the, the panel deformations, the connection deformations, you can get pretty close. But in a concrete building, you can be, uh, it can be much stiffer than you thought depending on what you assume for the modulus elasticities. Formwork doesn't bulge in, it form, bulges outward, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, so, um, and so in the guide, we actually suggest that, that not only do you look at the crack building, and, and there, there's, a, I say there, there's three things here. Ultimate strength, where you look at a highly cracked building. You have serviceability, perhaps less cracking. And then what if it's not cracked at all? Uh, and that can be that can be a thing, and uh, because uh, sometimes uh, uh, other systems, such as like the elevators, uh, may be sensitive to a to a different period. Say the building's tighter than 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 you might calculate for strength or wind tunnel, but but it may be so tight that uh, because it, it's it's a new building, it hasn't had any cracking yet, that that you'll have a harmonics with the elevator uh, cables. And so, so you need to kind of look at the, look at a range of answers, and, and don't assume that there's one there's one right answer. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. Does the design guide also provide recommendations for damping, for example, depending on the construction type, like concrete or steel, and also um, for building height? Not to my knowledge. Uh, that's an active debate. <laughs> I, I think uh, we talked about ranges. Uh, uh, it's for steel, concrete, and composite buildings, and now, of course, wood buildings are coming onto the scene. But uh, that's always a conversation that can be very uh, building dependent. You know, how slender is the building? Is it a composite system? Is it core shear walls or a tube building? So there's a lot of questions you got to uh, ask and think about as you work with, as a design engineer, as you work with a wind tunnel consultant. And usually it's a mixture of uh, opinions and uh, uh, we always try to bound the answer. In other words, let's look at a low damping, a medium damping and a high damping to get a feel for how it varies. And I, I could add something here, I think. I, we've noticed it's become much more common now for the engineer to consider a damping system from fairly early on in the design. And if you engineer a two mass damper or viscous damping system or some other damper, it actually gives you control over that parameter, the damping ratio, which otherwise, as you just discussed, is, is a rather uncertain parameter. I think it's interesting to uh, just real quick to, to point out how the slenderness of these towers has changed in the last 25 years. You know, when I was coming up as a young design engineer, a building that was seven to one aspect ratio was considered quite slender. And, you know, we had damping criteria and motion criteria for a building like that. And then it went to 10 to one and then it went to 15 to one. And, and now we're seeing these sliver buildings in New York that are actually up to 25 to one. So as Peter mentioned, when you get into that kind of a slenderness building, you almost have to think about artificial damping or supplemental damping systems to make the building work. Okay, next question, Justin. Yep. What would you suggest are the main talking points with building owners when choosing MRA? excuse me, MRI, based on my experience, what they normally say is to just refer to guideline standards so they can avoid legal or insurance issues. 
let's start with Bill. Uh, that's 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 a real that's a real issue. Uh, it, it's as much a commercial discussion as it is a technical one. Um, if you have a residential building that might go condo, you better you better be you better keep get your antennas up, okay? For, because of the liabilities issues uh, with that. Uh, if you have a building that's definitely going to be rental, then maybe it's you know it's maybe it's not maybe there's more uh, vagaries are, are acceptable. Uh, and so, you know, uh, so th that and the concern of office buildings being different, and it goes back to, you know, the, the quality and uh, so, say the, um, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, what, what is acceptable uh, is not is not black and white. You know, I know of some buildings that are fully occupied, which do, do, don't ma match the standards that we're proposing. But, but, you know, people have lived with them and they're acceptable and it's known. And uh, fully occupied. Uh, so, but you know, th this is for what we're trying to do is trying to for a going forward basis, but where it's a bit more um, rigor in it than perhaps we had in the past. But, but it, it is still a, a developing um, science. Larry, did you want to add anything? Well, I, I think it's very much dependent on the client and the sophistication of the client. Uh, personally, I, I, I uh, welcome the interaction with the client uh, and the communication to get a sense of, uh, you know, where are they coming from? Are they a, a developer that's going to sell the building and, and it, it's in there, they're in there for the short haul and making a profit on their investment? Or are we talking about an institutional owner that's going to own the building for a long time? And they're going to have a different perspective uh, on the, the whole thing. So. Very important to drag the client into the discussion and make him part of the uh, a decision and the architect as well. The whole design team needs to weigh in on this. Uh, and, and, and part of the conversation is the, uh, shall I say, the lack of precision. I, I've seen uh, reports where people uh, get upset about one tenth of a melody. That's ridiculous. OK, there's, there's I mean, you're lucky if you can figure out if you'll notice a different, three melody difference. You know, if you're in a building, it's like moving you know, nine versus 12. I don't know if you're going to notice it. Okay. Uh, you know, um, so yeah, part of it is, is, is trying to get, you know, you're, you're dealing with generally not, not as technical people as, uh, as, as you, the engineers and the wind tunnel consultants. And so you have to like, you know, try to, it's a difficult conversation. Uh, it's, you have to lead them to try to be practical at the same time. And I think uh, education plays a really important role here. I know when Roy Danoon was doing his PhD with the control towers in Australia, uh, once the air traffic controllers realised that buildings could move and it was in perfectly safe, the level of intolerance dropped dramatically. And, and again, so I think educating the building occupants can help greatly in blurring that boundary that Bill talked about between, you know, one and one and ten milligi because that's the population range anyway. Any any other comments on, on that question? Otherwise, we'll go to the next, Justin. How accurate are wind tunnel models and dynamic equations versus real building motion? Peter. Well, that's a good question. And fortunately, there have been uh, opportunities to do measurements in the building, uh, you know, after it was constructed, and um, I know uh, RWDI has been involved with some of this, particularly on buildings that have a, a damping system installed. Um, when we've been involved in the design of the damping system, part of the the work we do is to instrument it and monitor it for a few years afterwards, and. In general, we've been pleasantly surprised by the good correspondence between what we predicted and what we actually measured. Um, I think sometimes, though, we have noticed that there is a bias um, for the engineering calcul uh, calculations of natural frequencies to be uh, a little pessimistic, if you like. The frequencies are not normally a little bit higher, especially on concrete buildings. 
and, and the period's a little bit shorter than what the engineer calculates. Bill or Larry like to add? Yeah, I, I really uh, pleased to see that we're, we're having more success in getting some investments in monitoring these buildings. And I think it's really important to get that feedback uh, to the designers. Uh, none of us want to put a lot of mass and stiffness into these buildings if it's not necessary. So getting the field measurements, I think, is, is really important. And I think we're, be, we're learning more and more now with some of the ongoing monitoring programs that exist around the world. That's a, that's a good thing. Bill? No, I, I agree. Uh, we, we, more data is better. I mean, the, you know, if there's any way, you know, there's always these liability issues, and and a, and a, a client doesn't really want to know. <laughs> there's no upside for them, you know. Uh, but but to the extent you can get uh, get get a building uh, instrumented and monitored and then published and available to the to the profession, please please do so. That's a good point. Um, Justin, another question? Okay. Yeah, why don't we, we can do a few more here. Given that the climate is changing, is there some thought given to increasing the design wind speeds, loads that engineers need to consider? Well, I know Peter's done work in that space in Canada, so perhaps Peter, we'll start with you. Yes, um, in Canada, we have been uh, doing a study um, on how the climate might change in future in Canada. And of course, we've looked at more than just wind, but just focusing on wind, um, the predictions seem to be that over most of Canada, uh, the wind speeds may go up somewhat, but not a lot, except in certain areas, like on the west coast of uh, British Columbia, we're seeing local sort of hotspots where significant increases can be expected. Um, because our studies didn't go into the states, but um, the hurricane uh, occurrences seem to be becoming more frequent. I think that's uh, on, on record now. And so it will be a good area for further research, I think. Right now, it's difficult to say exactly how much one would increase, say, uh, wind speed requirements in something like the ASC7 standard. But it's an important question. Uh, and I think it's not been addressed in the, nine, the 2022 edition of ASC7, but there are thoughts to start addressing this in 26, uh, but Larry could probably talk to that. Yeah, uh, we're continuing looking at the wind speed maps and as we get more airport data and tweaking things a little bit. I, I think the new thing that's coming that might be of interest to people that don't know about it is the the next edition of ASC 7 will get into tornado design requirements. Uh, fortunately for category risk category two buildings, it won't be a requirement, but for risk category three and four buildings, you will now have to invoke a new chapter in ASC 7 and address uh, tornado loading, which of course can be uh, higher and could have an impact on the on the design. And Bill, did you want to add anything on that since you work all over the world? Well, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, you know, th this is more of a strength issue than a serviceability issue. So it could, it, it could, let me back up. Uh, you know, it could it could be more of a serviceability issue also. But but the strength is is the life safety is absolutely you know key to our profession. And it is interesting. Uh, these tall buildings are pretty safe. You know, uh, uh, we often, even if not required, will look at a 1,700-year uh, windstorm uh, for our strength design. Even though the code might let you get away with a 700-year windstorm, just just because of the importance of it. But at that extreme event, uh, you haven't really. Uh, it's not like an earthquake. You haven't broken anything. Uh, you know, you, you haven't really, you know, stretched the, you know, the, the, the building to its limit at all. And, and that's one of the things that this performance-based design in the future may look more to, you know, perhaps we're too conservative uh, in our designs for ultimate strength. 
I mean, mostly everything stays elastic in, in yes. wind load, so uh, there's plenty of capacity there. Yeah, when you think about it, so you, you got a 700 year event or, or a 1700 year event, and you're still elastic. Well, you, uh, you have some gas in the tank still. One would hope. Okay, <laughs> next question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Well, yeah, I just wanted to comment a little bit more on the climate change issue. Uh, one of the uh, questions which comes up for codes to address is what is the design life of the structure? Typically, we don't actually specify what that is, although some codes on bridges say it's 75 years, or and I think notionally most engineers think of it being as 50 years. So anyway, that affects how far into the future you're trying to look using these climate models, which have their own uncertainties. <clears throat> Added to that, you have to decide on what um, pathway are we likely to go in future, which depends on carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, that depends on politics. So there's a lot of uncertainties in trying to decide on a, on a criterion for the future. And I think the point that Bill made is really important. Uh, you know, serviceability issues. We've seen that the 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 criteria can range over an order of magnitude for human perception. So it, it doesn't make any sense to tighten that very much. But clearly, life safety is another issue, and strength issues will potentially um, play a role there. Uh, I think Justin, another question. Yeah. So building off this discussion about elastic design. The question is, assuming in the future, we as a field start implementing a ductility-based design approach using a reduced wind load for the crosswind forces on tall buildings, do you think we'll end up adopting the approximate 2% drift limit for seismic loads and simply provide expansion joints and the associated separation and the non-structural and envelope components? Uh, let's start with Bill. I'm not, that was a pretty a long question there. Um, uh, let me just back up. Uh, we had some an engineer write out Hurricane Alicia uh, down in Houston, okay, I, you know, a couple of decades ago. And it got up to around 40 millijes, and he had, a, he had trouble walking, okay? Uh, you, you know, and so I, I don't think you're going to want a building... Uh, <laughs> It's hard. The, the you know you can talk about strength, but the serviceability they're they're interrelated. They're not independent. Uh, you know I don't know what you mean by expansion joints. Uh, I, I you know I mean I, it is when you talk about the, the DDI and, and damage. You know if you if you properly isolate a, a a panel or a wall from the movement of the building, you know it's, all of a sudden it doesn't matter because it's not being strained by the building movements. Uh, but uh, you know the whole. Um, but 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 it is interesting to know. We don't really know what the ultimate strength of our tall buildings are. Uh, you know, it, it could be far far exceeding what 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 we're what we're assuming. Bill, uh, sorry, Larry. I know you've done some sort of pushover analyses of buildings in Houston. Did you want to talk to that at all? Yeah, I think one of the fascinating things that's coming on the scene now is what I mentioned earlier. Is this uh, time history modeling for, for wind loads. And uh, Peter Irwin and, and I were involved in a study with a PhD student at FIU where we actually took one of the uh, more infamous buildings that, that Bill knows about <laughs> uh, in Houston that uh, was known to be uh, extremely lively and that it wasn't even designed for, for drift. It was one of the early uh, 1968 vintage kind of buildings. And a uh, very light steel building, moment frame, 47, 48 story building. And it, it, it nowhere met any of the criteria uh, uh, that we use uh, today. Yet the, the building is, uh, you know, it was there for 30, 40 years before it was eventually uh, uh, strengthened. But, but the point is, uh, we studied that building in its original design, and we actually uh, looked at time history wind loading from the wind tunnel and tried to really assess, well, you know, what level of damping would it get as the wind speed increased and what would the performance be? And it, it's it's surprising how these buildings will fight to survive. 
<laughs> and assuming there's no global instability, uh, they got a lot of uh, resi inherent resistance, I think. And to Bill's point, I, I think we we really are keeping these buildings elastic, probably being a little bit conservative. But uh, I think we're going to learn a lot more with these wind time history wind tunnel studies that are going to become more routine in future tall building design. Uh, you know, on one of the debates, if you have a really, really rare, rare windstorm, do the win do all the windows blow out? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> With the windows gone, the, the air, air elastic damping change, the whole wind behavior changes. Yeah. So it's it's you know, it's a pretty complex question. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the topics in the in the pre-standard that we're talking about is the, I mean, the real weak link that costs money for owners is when the cladding systems fail, and then you get water intrusion and then it changes the whole dynamics of the building. If you if you you know have wind blowing through the building, uh, that changes the whole the whole ball game. So uh, the future is going to spend more time on making the cladding systems more robust to ensure that the, in these high wind events they don't leak and they don't fail. But you know, going to Peter's comment about the life of a building, if you keep the water out, if you're in a, if you're in a low seismic area where you're not going to have inelastic deformations, uh, and and it's your wind dominated region, and you keep the, the the water out, it could last forever. But basically, I mean, it, its life is more driven by commercial issues. Is there is there somebody want to tear it down and build something new? Uh, then it's not going to wear out. And and I to speak to that, uh, having done several hurricane uh, damage investigations, particularly in uh, Louisiana and Texas, I mean, tall buildings in Lake Charles had problems with water ingress and then loss of power, which led to black mold. And so, you know, the, the building had to be stripped out basically because um, of water penetration. So, yeah, the structure will last forever. These serviceability issues, I think, relate particularly to cladding. And that's where obviously more research is required. Okay, uh, Justin, another maybe question. We do, yeah, maybe we do one or two more here. Uh, should the non-building components such as exterior curtain wall, interior partition wall be included in modeling for the wind drift check? Bill. Uh, I mean, you, you need to be sure that they can take the movement, but, but, uh, you, uh, but, but we go through a great deal of effort to, to kind of Make them not part of the lateral system, okay? Because you know, you don't want to be racking these systems. So there, you know, you, you don't consider the cladding as you know, consider the weight as the mass and, and all that good stuff. But uh, but it's it's really not part of the lateral system. Now, having said that, does it happen sometimes? Uh, I'm aware of a building um, that we were we were called in on, which had um, it, it, it behaved better than it should. The nearest we could figure out is the cladding was helping. Okay, <laughs> you, know, the, you know, we were asked to look at it. it wasn't one of our buildings, so, and so we were looking at it, and uh, and it was behaving better. And, and the best we could figure is that the cladding was helping to stiffen it. Uh, you know, and um, but uh, and, I, and I've heard some stories from some other engineers on that. But a well-designed building with well-designed cladding, the cladding is not part of the lateral system. <laughs> No diaphragms. They're not diaphragms. <laughs> Larry, <laughs> want to comment? Yeah, we've well, been involved in, in a similar building where the uh, it seemed to be a whole lot stiffer than the structural engineer could justify. So it looked like a lot of the stiffness came from the cladding, but it had motion problems. It was only it wasn't a particularly tall building, but it was very flexible in, in the structure. And Larry, perhaps. Yeah, I just I'll just add when you think about the future and where we might go. I think Bill's absolutely right. The philosophy right now is particularly glass curtain wall systems. You want to isolate them and be sure they can go through the deformations, uh, you know, without damage, and they don't contribute that much to the stiffness. But you know, something to think about for the future is: can we design cladding systems that do participate with the lateral load resisting system and indeed become part of it and there have been some attempts to do that in some some buildings with mixed success but that that's a you know along with this supplemental damping maybe that's a a future uh, opportunity that uh, as we learn more about designing cladding systems uh, 
maybe we'll start thinking that way. And that talks to the point of uh, you know net zero carbon in a sense to make all the structure do all the all the work in a sense. So uh, Justin, any more questions or should we know. wrapping up? Why don't we make this the last one here? How do the accelerations at 432 Park and other tall slender buildings compare to the ATC recommendations? I'm not sure we should be talking about individual buildings. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I know. I know there were some monitoring. Uh, there were some monitorings of that building, and they verified that the projections of acceleration were pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. And this is another building. building. Sorry, Peter, but this is another building where you installed, uh, I think RWDI installed a couple of dampers in the top of the building. Yeah, that was in the design from the early stages. Yeah. My understanding of reading the New York Times on that issue was that there were quality issues, particularly in plumbing, that caused problems. But, you know, this is to the question that Bill raised earlier about the discussion with the client about the quality that's needed and that's got to extend obviously all the way through the built system not just the structure and not just the cladding but clearly the plumbing as well uh, you know and this is actually a big issue because you know buildings shorten okay and so your 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 vertical pipes and all those things they have to be able to take this movement and and you know particularly if you have a concrete building it'll 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 get shorter over time and if you don't detail it, the, pl the plumbing to take the movement, yeah, you can you can break a break a pipe. <laughs> and I think this talks to the story you were telling us earlier about the uh, Sears Tower and. Yeah, yeah, we we, we were talking about uh, um, the, the deformations and movements, you know, that if you know it's going to move and you detail for it, you know, you can you can you'll be okay. On, on the Sears Tower, uh, you know, the, um, the the building is symmetric up to a level 90, then above there it's not symmetric. So the building ha has a lean, okay, but but uh, the building went very quickly. So tenants were moving in towards the base before the building was topped out. So they were built, they were installing their partition into, into a symmetric building, okay. And so uh, we, we told everybody that you know, the building's gonna move. And so they had, they were, the tenants were supposed to detail their partitions to allow for this motion. And one of the tenants didn't. And guess what? The partitions cracked. Okay, so, you know, listen to your engineers. <laughs> and on that note, I think we'll end this discussion. Justin. Great. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, if you could um, proceed, Chris, to the, the last slide. And uh, just to note to everybody that we will be responding to questions that we weren't able to get to today in writing, and that will be submitted um, via email. So on behalf of the Applied Technology Council, I want to thank Chris for his presentation and Bill, Larry, and Peter for sharing their knowledge and insights and stories during the Q&A sessions. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us today and for all the excellent questions that we received. For those who registered today, expect to receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording of the webinar and a link to a participant feedback survey. Please provide your feedback because we do use that to continuously improve our webinar program. For those who registered today, also expect to receive a separate follow-up email with a link to purchase a PDH certificate. I'd also like to briefly mention that ATC provides trainings for organizations on a variety of technical topics like building safety evaluations after earthquakes, windstorms, and floods as documented in the ATC 20 and ATC 45 manuals. If you're inter interested in learning more information about that, please visit the ATC website. This concludes the webinar on serviceability design of tall buildings under wood loads brought to you by the Applied Technology Council. Have a great day, everyone.